Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to LVS Perspectives number 58, Education in Perspective. And um, quite a few hot topics today and something that we've not really spoken too much about, but something that became very evident uh, this week uh, with Keir Starmer talking about charitable status and that schools ask like schools like ours will retain their charitable status and we are a real charity remember we actually owned by the licensed trade charity but it's caused a lot of uh, for all a lot of uh, conversation a lot of debate and actually now I've had parents come to see me now to say you know what does it look like for us what does it mean for schools like us and some of our parents have also been uh, taking part in news items so on Sky News and Michaela's going to talk to us in a, in a bit as well and Tony who has written an article for the Daily Mail so we're going to talk about it today and we, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by looking at where the figures are coming from so the Institute of Fiscal Studies back in uh, July 2023, there's, that's where all the key facts and figures uh, that are being used um, have been published as well. And, it's, and if you look at the first one, I've just pulled a couple of points off here and it says that, you know, it assumes that income generated will be with no loss of numbers in the independent sector and could bring in a revenue of £1.6 billion pounds but, uh, and that's assuming a 15% VAT, because obviously if we have to charge VAT, we can also claim VAT back, but it would look about 15%. That's what it says within the document there as well. Uh, and that's with projecting that no one will leave, leave the sector, but we know that it could be because of the work that the ISC have done on engaging questionnaires for parents and, and um, schools, that it could be anywhere up between 20 and 25% of a drop off of children in our schools. So it is serious and something that we have to really start thinking about now because there could be an election within the next um, 12, 14 months time. And the money that the government would be hoping if Labour get in, let's just say if, because it's a long way to go and a lot can happen in politics over a year, that it, most of that money be used to help disadvantaged children uh, to plough back into the, the state sector as well. Uh, what's also interesting within that report, and if you haven't read it, which you're not likely to, because it's not very, you know, it's a bit dry, not the sort of thing you do on a Friday night with a glass of Chardonnay, but um, it's actually very interesting to read. And I just pulled out some things there as well. So, for example, it says that education as an invest it is an investment in human capital, and that economic theory actually argues for not taxing the investments at the point they are made but instead taxing the resultant increase later in life. Because it's actually proved that children in independent education that have been through independent education tend to earn more money in the future. And obviously, therefore, there's revenue from those children in the future. So, you know, economic theory backs up. Don't do it now. Don't do it now. And um, they, they also mentioned things like top up vouchers and for, for parents. So, for example, if you were given a voucher that for the to, to represent the amount of tax that you pay and goes towards a state place for your child, wouldn't it be a good idea to actually give you that voucher so you could decide where you want to spend it? And that would probably offset it as well. So, you know, could that happen maybe? Maybe that's something, you know, parents now need to probably become a little bit more vocal about why you're paying twice. And very interesting also, because the Labour government talk about social mobility. The quote here is, if the aim is to encourage more pupils into the state sector and reduce inequalities by school attended, then this policy package is likely to have only minor impacts as well. But it's causing us a lot of angst and it's something that we now have to seriously think about. And our, our school, and along with many other schools now, are working with tax consultants to see what the implications are for us and how we might be able to box clever so that we minimise the amount of uh, increase that we have to give uh, to you if it happens. Now, let's just pray that it doesn't happen. One, let's hope that they don't win the election. And two, that there may be, they might scrap it because it's such a really bad idea as well. So we're just going on to the next slide. These are the protect projections that the ISC have done as well, which actually shows within a five year period that there would be a significant loss by the end of those first five years as well, because the amount of children who will probably come out of the independent sector 
And then we've got all the questions about where do those children go? Because I know in this area, for example, there are waiting lists for state schools in this area. Um, but again, different figures. We just got to wait and see what happens and hopefully a little bit more work will be done to show that this actually doesn't stack up and that it's a really bad idea. And just moving on again, it is about parental aspiration and Rishi Sunak's been talking about this. You have a right to choose the education for your children. We put our children through private education, yeah, and it's painful because <laughs> when those bills drop through the, through the door, we have to find the money, but we decided to do that for our children and you've decided to do it for yours as well. It's your aspiration and your choice and we have a democracy, so why would you have that choice taken away from you? And I know that Tony Perry will have something to say about that when, he, when he's online a little bit later as well. So, he, Keir Starmer's being accused by Rishi Sudak of stoking a class war, taking away parental choice and Basically, let's just let's just hope that uh, we can turn this around in the next year or so, and let's hope there's some really good ideas about how we might be able to do it. Now, I've got Michaela Gartside here to start with, who is a Year 12 parent, and and her daughter Abigail has been with us since reception, and she took part in the Sky News interview last week. So, Michaela, over to you. Tell us your story. Hi, Christine. You put out an appeal last week um, for people to talk about obviously our experiences and obviously the implications of, of the VAT changes. And I think you used a word earlier. Um, we've always seen um, paying for the private education as an investment, an investment in, in, in Abigail um, and giving her an opportunity to do with it what she chooses to do in the future. But I think, as, as we said, when we were talking on the Sky News interview, LVS was much more than just the education. It was all of the other aspects that LVS was offering. Um, as a working parent, it was offering excellent wraparound care from breakfast club right through to after school and supper, if, if needed. And so actually it wasn't just a decision about paying for education, it was about paying for a whole service that enabled us as two working parents to facilitate working whilst also having that freedom of choice to choose what we did from an education point of view. That's fantastic and thank you for doing that interview, it was really good, <laughs> wonderful, all in one day. Really <laughs> That's great. What, what does Abby Girl think about it? Do you talk to her about it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as a year 12, they're quite focused on what's in the news. And and it's actually quite interesting. Um, we were comparing the other evening, in fact, actually, to a time when my parents chose to put myself and, and my brother and sister through private education. Um, and that was around about the time of assisted places being removed. Um, and of course, the school I'd set my heart on going to, assisted places got removed. So mum and dad made loads of sacrifices. Um, so we've had those conversations about parents choosing where they spend their money. Um, and, you know, the one we've chosen is, is education. Great. And are the children actually talking about it? Did she talk about it with her friends at all? I think they talk about lots of different things from a news point of view. Certainly, I think as year 12s, we're seeing them being much more interested in the wider world. Um, how much they're talking about this yet, I, I don't think it necessarily has hit them what it may mean. And of course, as year 12s, they're thinking they're at the latter end of this. But I think, you know, as a parent, you have to think about it. Not only, you know, we've got a short period of time left in education with Abigail, but actually for the future generation and, you know, as an HR director, um, again, that investment in talent, let people choose where they spend the money because we need some great people in the workplace in the future. And also, and I don't know whether Abigail is, is looking to go to university after the sixth form, but if they tax the schools, the next one will be the universities. Have you thought yeah. about that? And I think that, that, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I've, we've thought about it from an HR perspective, um, you know, whether it's tax on, on universities or will they start to tax other childcare? You know, there's a lot of after school provision that isn't taxed. Um, what about things like tutoring where people are investing in tutoring? Um, you know, what is that future in terms of what next? That's great. I hope you stay with us just in case we get some questions for you, because if there are any parents yeah, out there who me. want to send a question through. Um, so if you say then, have, have we got T Tony on the line? 
and Tony's here as well. So Tony is a parent of a junior pupil. Tony, are you there? Can you tell us your story? I am here. It's nice to see all of you and thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my son, Norman, is in year six uh, in the junior school. Uh, he started at LVS just last year uh, as a year five student. Um, and it was a difficult and really hard choice for us to make the transition into private school. It wasn't an easy one, certainly not financially uh, for us. And it's one that took a lot of planning and a lot of life choices uh, to do it. Uh, but my son has special education needs. He was diagnosed with ADHD when he was in year two uh, and has always struggled with reading and writing. Um, and we didn't feel that he was getting the support that he needed in the school that he was at, though they tried their best. Um, and we worried about his options for secondary school. Uh, there just aren't as many options for boys where we live. Uh, as there are for girls. Uh, and so we felt that to give our son the best uh, chance uh, to grow and realize his potential that we needed to make a move. Uh, and so we decided to go to LVS uh, in part from uh, speaking with other parents uh, in our community whose children go there, uh, as well as the fact that it's both a junior and a senior school, so that our son makes one transition in essence, not having to start uh, again and and uh, trying to rebuild friendships in, this, in essence twice. Uh, and so that's been our plan. Um, and so now labor trying to add 20% on the school fees. And mind you that going from junior school into senior school, the fees do jump as well. Understandably, there are different experiences, different resources that are needed to deliver that education. But it is a it does become quite a steep hill to climb. Uh, and I've I, I have to say I've given a lot of thought in terms of uh, what Labour have said that they're trying to do and what's happening and, and kind of why. I mean, politically, I don't I will say I don't fit neatly into any of the British political parties. I agree with parts of e where each of them stand on. Uh, but this one I obviously struggle with. Uh, and the more I, I think about it, uh, I think part of it is that the idea of adding VAT uh, to the, some of the arguments were around le breaking the class uh, ceiling. Uh, and also, I think uh, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves had said something about, well, you know, she wanted her children to see the world as it really was, she told the Times earlier this year, uh, with the implication, of course, the private schools don't deliver that. Uh, and it's not just, quote, wealthy people that are doing, you know, that are that are sending their children to private school. There are many families uh, like mine, Michaela, you're in a similar boat, I gather, and others who make real life choices, you know, in terms of where what they do for their children and, and how they invest any money that they may have. Um, the other part of this is that the there's a glaring hole uh, what about grammar schools? If you look at the top 100 secondary schools, certainly in the state sector, uh, in the Times, 94 of the top state secondary schools are grammar, with a few that are semi-selective in the mix. And you know, studies from Comprehensive Futures show that grammar schools, uh, the proportion of children that have free school meals, for example, are far lower than in comprehensive schools. And also it naturally rules out children with special education needs, most of them. Uh, I mean, having to pass a single exam on a single day, that is the criterion, full stop, uh, let alone being able to afford property that happens to be nearer to a grammar school. So if they really want to, you know, provide an opportunity for all children, what is their policy on grammar schools? I would really want to know that, particularly as a parent who has another child where that could be an opportunity uh, that, that meets that fits with her. I would also add that it's very inconsistent with Labour's wider approach to tax uh, without getting into the pluses and minuses of these policies. But, you know, one of the most controversial aspects of the mini budget we had last year uh, with Liz Trust was removing the 45p tax rate. Uh, and Labour have said that they're not going to reintroduce that uh, or add a wealth tax or other areas uh, because they, they they say that we can't tax our way to more funds. Uh, and that comes from the shadow chancellor. So if that's the case, then why? And they say that we need to grow our, our economy to have more money for public services. So why isn't the same applying to our schools as well? 
so I think that there's a lot of pieces here that are not adding up and it will hurt many of the people that Labour ostensibly claim to defend and back. Fantastic. And it might not actually be uh, attract many votes off for them, I, I would assume, because if you look at the amount, uh, the amount of children in private ed, you know, two parents voting, maybe grandparents as well. That's a lot of votes, isn't it? So, Tony, as a parent who's obviously really passionate about this, what what's going to happen next as far as parents are concerned, do you think? Um, do you mean in terms of if there's VAT or in terms of trying to fighting this? Make a case. Sorry? For, for fighting it. Oh, for fighting it. Yeah. I think the biggest part of this uh, is sharing stories, as many of us as possible sharing stories, uh, speak with your MPs uh, and and others, get that out there. The fact that this is this is regular people, so to speak, that this is hurting. Uh, and how? why is this different from other policies? And, and at the end of the day, we are talking about children. We're talking about children that are going to have to change schools and and settle into entirely new environments, uh, and they may and then children that may not get the support that they need. I mean, let's say that Labour introduced this VAT straight away, and let's say it's as early as next September, which is what worst case estimates put it. Uh, then when are state schools going to see that? State schools across the country, which state schools? How are they going to make sure? Because every year that a child passes through. It's another school year, another year of development. It's easy to talk about these numbers in, in the whole, but when you talk about children having to wait one, two, three years to maybe get something, well, they've already getting their, their life paths are already being etched in a given way. It's already being scarred by these sorts of choices and, it, and it's collateral damage, frankly. So I think I would, uh, for me, the biggest focus, and I'm certainly doing all I can uh, to raise awareness. I've written an op-ed that's due to go out uh, in the mail in the coming days. Uh, and uh, if other parents just share with your friends, your neighbors and others, um, the effects that this would have, that this is actually more than just a couple of pence you know added into something uh and and it really does matter this is children that we're talking about and and this is ultimately about giving as labor ostensibly want to do giving children the best opportunities in in life this is not doing that no and we met earlier in the week and you were telling me how norman has responded to being here can you tell us what you well tell us yes what you, absolutely you i meant to add that my apologies um so yeah norman has absolutely flourished we've started year five uh where my, my son does not see phonics in the way that most so like the idea of just sounding out a word does not resonate with him he has learned to read by memorizing words he'll recognize a word cat dog house whatever as that word so that when he sees it or something near enough to it that's what he says and over you know four years coming into the fifth year that's how he's been able to read um, and he got uh, very good support at LVS um, he has had support from the Senco uh, in the school he uh, who have been able to spend dedicated time with him helping him with his reading and his writing uh, he's also had scribes uh, when needed within the classroom. The teachers are very understanding as well. Uh, for example, I was told, well, if you read to Norman, you know, if I read to him, that counts as his reading, as his, you know, as 20 minutes a day reading, which is great because we do that anyway. So, I mean, we do, of course, have him read when we can, but it's not trying to force him through 20 minutes of a book. Uh, and the school itself has been very accessible. So, for example, making YouTube videos and other uh, audio formats of stories available to children where reading may be more difficult so that they can participate. And through that year, I look back, I see Norman reading signs. I see him uh, just kind of absorbing the world around him in a way that he couldn't before it has been night and day and the community has just been it's, this is the right place for our son that's the long and short of it and you know my wife and i uh have been looking around at other schools just as kind of the plan b because we don't we you know we have to look around at what the options are we don't have much choice because labor are gonna try to price us out of 
out of things. And it's been hands down, LVS is the right place for our son. The, the support that he's got, the community there, the friends that he's made, the teachers, the the the, the feel there is a, it's a very nurturing environment. It's one where he can really come into his own form. Uh, and, and that's what we've seen over the past year. That's what I'm seeing now in year six as well. Um, and and it's just, as I say, it's just been night and day. And like our our what we can see in terms of his path, what his strengths, what his potential are, what difference he might make in the world. We're already seeing changes in that. Um, and, and so I you know, I couldn't recommend LVS highly enough. Uh, it has it has been pretty much a lifesaver for us, I think, in that respect. That's wonderful. And I think you're right. The majority of our parents, dual income, they have to make a lot of sacrifices. They invest heavily in this for their children. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not an easy couple of, you know, 20 grand that you slop away like you have a pizza takeaway or something. Right. I don't I think that most parents are probably in that boat where you know, adding in, you know, paying school fees, let alone 20% more, it's not exactly easy to do. Uh, it's easier for some than others, sure, but it's not, you know, a, a simple thing like, well, I'll go and buy this instead of that in the shops. It's life-changing. It is. It is life-changing. Tony, thank you very much. If you can just stay there in case we get some questions coming through. Okay, Pleasure. because, and, and that's great to hear that Norman is so happy and Abigail too. So just moving on, so because we are, we do not support any political party. We sit right on the fence, right in the middle. Um, there's also, you know, um, Rishi Sunak at the, the Conservative conference this week announced the sort of the new IB idea, a new advanced British standard. And you know, sometimes you know, it, it's really good actually that there is they're talking about change. But what really worries me is that it's going to take ten years. 10 years. So even Tony's child, who's in year six, would have left school before this actually implemented as well. And, you know, it's great that the, the curriculum's going to be broader, but to, I, I, was, I was listening to the radio the other day and there's a lot of children in that, um, in that age bracket actually who are saying, well, I've got enough math skills. I've got enough math skills that I need at GCSE. Why would I need to do more? Why should I have to study maths up until the age of 18? And, and in an ideal world, it's great to study maths to, the, to your 18. You know, maths is brilliant. It's a beautiful science. Uh, but where, where, where are we going to get the teachers from? And I thought it was really funny. Well, it is quite funny when you look at the, the supposed bonus of £30,000 over five years. Well, in 10 years from now, ah, what's that going to be worth? So hopefully that might just go up with, with you know, inflation, etc. Um, but we in the education system, we have to deal with constant change. You've only got to see the, 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 the many ministers of education that we had, the many times that curriculum changes and how expensive that is as well. And really, should education be out of the, the, the power of a singular party? Because we need stability and we need to look at it long term as well. Because what about AI? Look what we've seen in one year. We've seen this in one year. We've seen AI be, is going to revolutionise what we do. What does the world look like 10 years from now? Because the proposal that they're coming up here now, I, ca I can't imagine what the world is going to look like in two years from now, never mind 10. And will that, actual, will that curriculum be fit for purpose? And how much money is it going to cost over the next 10 years to develop that as well? And I've heard some of my colleagues say, well, were teachers, were head teachers, were examiners, were they consulted over this to see what they think? And also to ask children as well. And if you're going to change it at a -le the A-level years in, in Key Stage 5, what about GCSEs as well? And I know some children will say GCSEs are fine, they're fabulous, and they've really set me up for, for moving on to A-levels and BTECs. Other children might think that they're not so useful. But really, is it far-reaching enough, this? Is the forecast of what may happen in this world, is it there? Because what is this world going to look like in 10 years? I'm not a scientist. We probably have flying cars by then. You know, we might have robots walking around us. We do already. So how, how does this stack up as well? Tony, I'm going to bring you back in. What do you think?
Sorry, I just mean I agree with that. Um, I think those are really good questions. And in fact, one of them, the one question I think that jumps out most to me is why do we have why is there an English baccalaureate? If there's an international baccalaureate that already has its own evidence base, and some schools in the UK are already using it. Why not go with that? What is this going to be adding? And I, th I think that that's another layer to this. Uh, also, as you point out, what what is the path? What is the value of this going to to be? I think that's the other part that uh, goes through my mind. If I look back within the United States where I grew up, high school education, is, so our sixth form, uh, has been so devalued that most people can't get a job without going into university unless it's you know a minimum wage uh, level role. So, you, you know, there are children that are graduating uh, that or, the, or there are communities where there are the overwhelming proportion of children lack basic skills in English and maths that have that through education. You know, so when I grew up, there was maths that went all the way through, English that went all the way through, history and so on. So just having kids in the classroom is not doing it. Uh, it, it's it's just, it's devastating. There's a city of Baltimore in Maryland that just recently made the news when zero percent of their children had, I believe it was math standards, uh, in secondary school had actually met the state defined math standards. So that's not exactly even those standards aren't exactly flying through calculus or whatever else. We're just talking about being able to function and zero percent. So I think that changing the curriculum around I, I think i guess is the question is what is it you're trying to solve uh, i like the a level system overall i i do have my own questions around the, the idea of your mark being based on one exam uh in the end as opposed to say school work coming through i think that there are issues there but the wider idea of being able to go into more depth uh, and being able to choose subject areas. I think that there's a real positive to that. And I would also add that it serves students rather well. I mean, we have some of the best universities in the world here in the UK, and those are from students that have sat the A-levels uh, and, and have gone through and become leaders in the country and the world. So I would want to go back into what exactly it's trying to solve. Uh, I would also add that uh, I think that this also has to be looked at in the context of university itself. There's been a huge push, and I know Labour uh, are, are still pushing for this, uh, of trying to get more people into university. But again, why? At the least, you're going to devalue the, you know, an, a, an undergraduate degree and then force more people to go through that and then going into graduate school with all the debt that comes with it. Why not rethink this all together? So going into the uh, building on the, the level, the skills, the knowledge that students are already getting through um, secondary school and sixth form, and then thinking around, well, what do they need to, to grow and how do they do this outside of university? I think I don't think you can look at this, this uh, British uh, baccalaureate uh, or English baccalaureate without looking in terms of the role of university uh, within society and, and the changing world of work. Thank you. And Michaela, you, uh, um, hopefully you're still there. Now you're, um, you're yeah. part of our well group and we've been talking mm -hmm. about skills for future. You're also an HR professional yeah. as well and you've got a daughter in the sixth form. If this was coming, say Abigail was coming in and this was in now, mm -hmm. what do you think she'd think about it? Um, I think it would be quite hard because I think actually she's quite enjoyed the transition from GCSE to A-level, um, that ability to focus and go a little bit more in depth. I mean, we're only a few weeks in, but she's thoroughly enjoying and seems to be flourishing doing that. Um, but I think fundamentally, and I think it goes back to some of the conversations we've had at the WOW meeting, um, we can't just take one section of education in isolation. We need to look at it much more holistically um, because if we're going to change A-levels, and it's going to take us 10 years to change A-levels, actually, what's going to happen to GCSEs or, or whatever else in that period of time that's going to equip them ready for the change that they're going to experience and, and then following through, whether it's apprenticeships, university. But also, as we've often talked about in the WOW meetings, um, it's much more about skills. We do not know what the world of work is going to look like two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And we really need to start skilling people so that they can have 
careers that are going to span different sectors, different skills bases, but they've got a core of skills that are going to be essential to them. And I think the other thing I sort of can't quite get my head around yet, and the T levels being very new to us, but actually we seem to be pushing people down an academic route again, rather than having a variety of routes that gives flexibility, because there are many things that people will need and it isn't just about learning from books it's about the skills we bring it's about the different opportunities that we have you know one of the big advantages of the t level is the work placement developing skills in the workplace well how is that going to fit in this new model so i think there's lots of questions and again i I fear that you know you take one piece of it but you we won't have the right foundations in place because we won't have changed those and we won't have the the end piece because that won't have changed. So it seems very narrow just to look at one aspect only. And there's a bit of contradiction there as well, isn't there? Because as you just said, it's pushing more towards an academic slant again. Mm-hmm. And yet we're supposed to be developing those vocational and entrepreneurial skills yeah, yeah. and apparently doing away with these so-called rubbish degrees at university, which some of them are very mm-hmm. vocational. And OK, they, 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 they cost a fortune. And I think the whole student loan thing should be completely scrapped. And I'll tell you, if the, if the government mm-hmm. wanted to help our young people get rid of those loans... Yeah. And, you know, do what, you know, other countries in the world do not charge Mm. for their university education. And we need more vocational training Mm. and apprenticeships and skills in that way. But um, anyway, we can hold, let's hold out and hope that there'll be more to come. It just seemed a bit strange to have a one-off, like you said, a little snippet of education. It's the lack of, it's the lack of integration. It's the lack of looking at the whole picture and what are our problems? What, and what solution do we therefore need? Let's not propose a solution at this stage until we understand what we actually need. Absolutely. And when you look at the amount of children who actually fail maths at GCSE nationally as well, those poor children, you know, I can understand they've got to get to a certain standard, but most of them probably, you know, they're not going to enjoy school if they're going to be forced to do something that they don't actually, doesn't come quite naturally to them. But as long as they've got those functional skills. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Great. So thank, thank you, Michaela and, uh, and Tony. Thanks very much for your input. Keep up the fight, everyone. OK, we're going to move on now uh, to the next slide. So um, we need you for the Sixth Form Development Day on the 24th of November. So what we're looking for is we're looking for uh, parents who have got a particular skill, um, particular interest. So I've been contacted by parents already who run small businesses. They're going to talk about set, setting up your own business. I've had parents who are going to come and talk about AI. Uh, we also think we're going to, you know, we need to maybe give them a little bit of um, a few lessons on sort of financial planning, you know, that the things that the essential skills. And uh, one thing we're really keen is it's, it's trying to encourage young people to think about a pension because we know it's a long way away. But I think any and anybody who's uh, been putting away the pennies since they were you know, first in work, we'll probably be reaping the benefits of it. Uh, we all haven't done that, but we, that came up in the WOW meeting as well, the, important of, the importance of understanding what the future brings as well. We've got a, a keynote speaker, Varna Parker. That's gonna, I'm really looking forward to that. This lady is a bit of a risk taker, but it's what all the skills that you want your children to be able to embrace in life. And we're going to look at some psychometric testing for them as well. So if you can give us a talk on anything, it doesn't matter what you do, if, you, if you're passionate about something, can you uh, please email me um, or email Claire and we will um, get that going. It's going to be in the afternoon. The talks are going to be in the afternoon between two and four o'clock. If you can't get here physically, we could probably do them on the, online as well. But the more people we've got, the better. Then what we can do is go out to our young people and say, what sessions would you like to take part in? So that's we need you. We need you. OK, right. Next slide. This is over to Mrs. Petro now. Are you there, Sharon? Yes, I am. Yes. yes. Hello. Hi. OK, so um, I've been listen, listening avidly to what you've all been discussing because um, I'm just on the other end of it now. My son has just recently finished year 13 and my other son is at university as well. And having had my two, both of my boys going through private education from reception age, I know how difficult it, what it, it, it has been and what a huge choice it was for us to to put them through that. Now, we've we've talked recently about if they if we had been in the education system when um, they put the 20 percent on it would have priced us out immediately and it's quite scary to think about what we would have done with our boys where we would have sent them because the reason why we went into the private system was because we we were able to vote with our purse 
so to speak but it was we we made a huge sacrifice to do so so I really do feel for everybody and you know even though I'm on the other end of it I would be one of those people who would fight too that this is not the right way to go however I'm here to talk about something different I'm going to talk about our scholarships program because we believe that um, at LVS, we it's not just about the academic, it's about everything else as well. So if I could just have the next slide, please. Um, so our scholarship programme has undergone a major transformation in the last year. Um, we still have uh, scholarships and awards as we have done in the last few years, and, and that won't change. But what we offer our scholars, what, um, what we bring our scholars in to do has completely changed. And, and and, and, and that's what we are looking for. So we offer scholarships at year seven and, and uh, then going into year 12. And at the moment, uh, we're getting quite close to the deadlines for application for those scholarships. So I just wanted to remind you a bit about the process today and a little bit about what we do for our scholarship programme. So for year seven, we have academic scholarships and also the scholarships for performing arts, sports and the creative arts, as I like to call them. Um, and we, we accept applications internally. So those pupils we have in year six are encouraged to apply for them and those uh, who are coming into the school from, from other schools. If they're awarded in year seven, they usually carry on throughout year 11. But one thing that we've brought in is we do monitor our pupils who are scholars to make sure they're making the most of their scholarships and they're, they're giving back to the school as much as we are giving to them. Uh, just next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit on the application. You can see there, I won't go through everything, but um, you basically complete, um, complete an application online. And then we have an exam morning in November for all our internal academic scholars. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then we have assessment days for the other types of scholarships. Um, we will invite all external candidates to attend an exam morning and the scholarship assessment days, but we would send you all of the information on that. Um, and we, we interview all of our internal and external candidates. Um, they will meet a member of the senior management team, as well usually as the heads of departments if they are applying for one of our other types of scholarships. Next slide, please. So I'll just, just a little note on our um, academic scholarship exam. Um, we ask all of our candidates to sit a CAT for, that's a GL assessment. They've all done them in their various forms in whatever school your child may be in in year six and it's, it's an aptitude test and then we ask them to sit a maths and English test now I just need to add there is no need for your child to prepare or revise for these exams we want to see what level they are at now so no extra tutoring is needed um, it's probably the maths and the English tests are a little bit alike the old 11 plus exams but really it's nothing that if you feel that your child may be an academic scholar it's nothing that they would not be able to just come in and do so again we don't want anybody to feel they are in any way prohibited from entering one of these exams and that everybody should have a go if they if they wish to do so next slide please Okay, so moving on to the year 12. So we call these the Spirit of LVS Awards and we don't really divide these into any categories. And the reason we do that is because as, as you know, LVS is a very special place and there, you know, we have pupils that give something very different and it might not be the traditionally academic uh, pupil. They might be good at something that we don't actually have in school, such as golf, um, such as, a, you know, another sport or a, a string of the performing arts that we, again, we don't have in the school. But we welcome um, applications for Year 12 scholars from any discipline. And that's why we call them the spirit of LVS. Now, what we ask people to do for um for to apply for these types of award is they will be they need to write a letter of motivation to um to mrs kenneth the reason why they feel they have the spirit of lvs what they can offer our school because as i say it might be um a golfing um you know 
and the next British golfer, but they might be able to offer some um, uh, extracurricular golf lessons or something, or some something on individual st- sports or or sports stan- stamina or something. So everybody has something to give. Again, the deadlines um, and all the key dates are on the website, um, but that's coming up pretty soon as well. And what we do is we we look at all of the letters of application and then we have a short interview with all of the potential scholars. Um, Next slide, please. I know I'm going through this pretty quickly, but I want to talk a little bit more about the programme towards the end. So here are the key dates, and these are pretty fixed at the, well, they are fixed at the moment. So as you can see, the deadline for any applications is coming up. Um, And uh, also, you would be sent uh, details on the assessment days, what constitutes for there's the sports, performing arts and creative arts um, assessment days, what we would expect your your child to, to bring to those assessment days. Also, you'll be given more information on um, what would be uh, on the exam day and the timings for that. Um, and also there's the deadline for the year 12 scholarships, the spirit of LVS awards. But one thing I will say about the year seven scholarships, we don't want the process to be in any way scary. Um, I know that lots of schools, I mean, my children themselves, they went through entrance exams and they can be quite stressful. We don't want this to be a stressful um, uh, process. It's 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 a good thing for for young year six to maybe have that first you know experience of an interview um, situation maybe not being successful in their application as well it's it's all about what builds the character in the end but we are very aware when we are interviewing a year six pupil that it could be very scary to be in the in the room with an adult so there's absolutely nothing to be worried about on the assessment days they're taken care of and certainly for the academic exams as well we make sure they're well looked after and well fed um, between exams so all of the key dates are there but I just I just want to um, talk a little bit about what we have planned um, already for our scholars this year. So it's not just about the financial reward that we offer. We offer a scholars programme. Our scholars are our ambassadors for our school. We're very, very proud of them. We're very proud of what they give to us. So we, you know, we're trying to give back to them. Um, so far this term, we, we've had one scholar's lunch, we've kicked that off, and we had one of our parents is actually um, a designer and makes props for um, films such as Star Wars, Harry Potter. Um, he brought those in and gave a lecture to all of our scholars, not just our art scholars, and it was absolutely fantastic. Um, I couldn't believe, I wish I could have taken a photo of some of the things, but we weren't allowed to. Um, and it was amazing. His story was amazing, and it was inspirational to our scholars um just hot off the press we've got now um just been booked in for our next scholars lunches we've got a, we've got somebody coming in who is part of who is a flying doctor who will talk about being part of an a and e team in the air those first response and that's going to be really exciting um i did ask if he could bring their helicopter into the school and land it on the school grounds but i don't think that's going to happen but still i think that will be a really good session uh, we've also got a professional basketball player coming in who will talk about being an elite athlete again this is not this is for the sports scholars but we include others as well good to remember as well that our scholarship program even though obviously it's open to all of our scholars we do invite our highly able pupils as well we recognize that not of our pupils are scholars and that through their education they might start to you know they might start to show um, abilities and talents in certain areas and they're invited onto our program as well because we think that everybody should be able to access these programs that we have so it's not just for a, a small elite group but it's an exciting program it's growing by the month and this year we will have some more specialized programs in the disciplines as well I know that I've um, I've sped through that as I usually do but if there are any other questions any questions about the administrative side of the um, application process please do contact admissions or if you want any further information please don't hesitate to um, to email me 
Okay, I'll hand back to you now, Christine. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's brilliant. It comes around quickly, doesn't it? Every year. Oh, gosh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I had um, a question come through on our previous um, uh, topic. Um, hello, Christine. My challenge to the change to A-levels is surely you would then need to change university degrees, particularly the first year. For example, an 18-year-old currently taking three A-level sciences to enter medical school would change to presumably have five subjects with a new baccalaureate. Would they have the depth of knowledge in the subjects required to study their specialism at uni once they get there? That's a really good question, actually, isn't it? Sharon, have you got any thoughts on it? I know we weren't going to talk about this together, but... Yeah, I mean, I think that they will. They'll have to change the university degree, degrees. If you look at the depth they go into with the uh, international baccalaureate, then um, they certainly they don't have the level that our, you know, traditional root science A level pupils have. So they'll they're going to have to almost add another year onto the beginning of a of a med degree if they decide to go down this route. So whilst I think it's really good that maybe, you know, they may develop develop more academic skills and they'll they'll throw in more maths and English there. I still think that there's, you know, we we specialize soon enough. We don't specialize too soon, but um, they're going to have they're, they're not thinking of the bigger picture. They'll have to change the degrees because there is absolutely no way that somebody could go on to a med degree if they haven't already got the base that they need in, you know, those three A levels and not watered down by any other subject. That's my thought anyway. Yeah, that's a really good point. And don't go mm. away because I'm going to have another question for you in a moment because it's something I didn't okay, answer, okay. go into earlier is that there are two quite leading independent schools who are doing away with GCSEs. And uh, they've been criticised by the strictest head teacher in the UK, which isn't me, because I am not strict. Well, I am strict, but I'm not that strict. Um, as being, you know, sort of a bit of a cop out for them. And do you know what? I think they're quite brave. I mean, there's one in particular, they've got their own farm. And um, I think it's wonderful that they can actually, they've got the confidence to be able to do their own exams. I think that is, that's incredible. It's a bit brave. It's not something we would do. Um, I think we, we, we're not that much of a risk taker. What do you think? In, in fact, in this getting our own farm. <laughs> in in Sorry, scrapping I mean, GCSEs and doing our no, own exams. No, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. I, th I do believe we've got to change our GCSEs. I do, I, I do believe that. Um, and we've been actually looking at the curriculum for next year. And having looked at the results from last year, and how they've changed the boundaries and they're not going to change anymore. We do need to look at not just our school, but every school at tweaking what they have to make sure that it is really starting to um, starting to, to give them the skills that they need. And there are already um, uh, qualifications out there that are more relevant to our pupils right now. OK, so so but scrapping GCSEs, absolutely not. I mean, I, I, I would be I would be in favour of bringing back some um, some of the coursework elements again. But then we've got the whole, you know, AI, AI question in there. But um, bringing uh, scrapping them all together, I think I think. I just don't think we should go there. There has to be, there has to be some sort of um, exit exam or assessment in some way. We need to be able to assess our pupils. We've got to relook at it, but we need to assess them in some way. There needs to be some kind of bar. And GCSEs give us a standard. Yes, they need to be changed but we've still got that standard. And the thing is, again, comparing it to with European countries, they don't have that exit list at, 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 um, at 16. We are very different to countries such as uh, France and Spain. They do something at the end of at 18, but there's pupils that should already be in, in the sort of the technical colleges, the specialist colleges. And so I think we do our, our pupils, a, a, you know, a, a a, a service by putting something in at, at 16. So scrap them, no, change them, yes. Yeah, and, and also, get them and we, get we, them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we need a bit more land. Um, yes. A little field or somewhere. But the um, what's lovely about LVS is that we do change our curriculum and we look at the cohort coming through, don't we, every year. So we started sociology this year 
which is, I think it's been really successful, hasn't it, so far? It's been really, really successful. I say so myself because I'm teaching on it. But um, no, but but that's really good. And it's funny because we were talking last week about the voucher system and that's that was put forward about by one of the sociologists um, talking about the value of education and everything that was put forward 60, 70 years ago. So, you know, this voucher scheme is is, is not a new idea, but um, no, but it's really good. Again, sociology, it's just, I mean, it was quite in in fashion in the late 80s, early 90s, because I did the it did the A level and then it went out again. But you know, it's it's looking at what what the pupils need. I mean, looking at the sports uh, qualifications, you know, and looking at the, at the content of them. Our heads of department have been really good at saying, okay, maybe now it's time for us to change. Maybe we need to look towards this. We need to change boards. We need to look at the content of what our pupils are doing, because our pupils are this profile. And we've even looked as far as to say next year we should do this but the following year with the cohorts that we've got coming up we should be thinking of doing that so you know we we're very flexible here and we will you know we will offer our pupils what we know is good for them and we can't change the world but we can certainly give them at the moment what we know that they need from the information we have about them that's brilliant thank you sharon Okay. I'll see you shortly. And going on to the last part today, I think we have our new chair of the PTA, Victoria. Are you there, Victoria? Hello, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Amazing. I've been <laughs> muted. <laughs> Hi, I'm Victoria. Um, unfortunately, Amanda, the outgoing chair, couldn't um, be here this afternoon. I'm afraid she has a work commitment. But we really wanted to take the opportunity just to plug the PTA and really drum up more interest and more involvement. I'm not sure, oh, there's the slide. Hopefully you can all see the slide that Amanda shared with us at the AGM on Monday. Um, I mean, if this doesn't, you know, if this doesn't explain the value of having a PTFA, um, I, I don't know what does. We could see there all the, the highlights and the wonderful successes of, um, of the work that the committee and volunteers and donors did last year. So we really want to build on this. Um, there's really no pressure, um, but I'm told that, um, Last year was the most successful year. It built on the year before and previous years. And this has been the most successful fundraising year yet. So um, there's big boots for us to fill this year, but we've got lots of ideas um, that were brought to the AGM on Monday. Lots of exciting plans uh, for events and fundraising activities in the year ahead. So we're going to spend the next couple of weeks bolting down some dates and uh, there'll be further updates to follow. Um, but as I say, we really want to just encourage people to get involved. Um, my little boy is in year one. He joined in reception last year. He's also loving the school. Um, but it's it's very new to me still. Um, there are lots of new parents that join year on year. Um, so it's, it's a lovely opportunity to come along and get to know other parents. Um, with that in mind, we're also keen to... Um, build uh, more informal get-togethers into the calendar. So not necessarily just the fundraising um, and the big events, but more informal things and um, it, more opportunities to really build the parent community and also think about the school as part of the wider community, whether that looks like engagement with local businesses or community initiatives. Um, so any ideas that anybody has there, we'd really welcome them. Um, please do get in touch with us. Um, Oh, a plug I, I was asked to make. I'm sorry, I'm three days in, so I'm really still trying to absorb all of this information. But a plug I was asked to make uh, specifically is about secondhand uniforms. So you can see on the infographic there that uh, secondhand uniform sales uh, raised over £2,000 last year, which is incredible. But in this academic year, in September alone, it raised £750, which is obviously fantastic. And we really want to keep that up. So a big push for donations for anybody that has, uh, uh, you know, over uh, outgrown uniform, um, but also people that are interested in purchasing secondhand uniform as well. Please have a look at the exchange on the website. That segues lovely into um, an update. And this is a real time update because I've just received a WhatsApp to say it's, uh, it's now live and updated. Uh, we now have a dedicated PTFA section on the school website. So uh, all fundraising initiatives, events, um, contact details, the uniform exchange, um, and then all of our housekeeping and compliance materials, policies, etc. All listed there now in one place, um, as I say, with all our contact details. So you can find all of this information there. 
we will send some updates in the next couple of weeks once we've bolted down some dates. And um, I think I think that's it. Sorry, I'm whizzing through a list here. But as I say, just a, a big plug for getting involved. Come along, the more the merrier. Everybody's lovely. I'm naturally quite introverted, so don't be shy. Um, I found them all to be so friendly. It's been lovely to make new friends and just keep building on the value of the wonderful work that they've done so far. Um, all of this serves to enrich our children's lives and education. Um, some of the projects I think are listed on the infographic as well. Some of the projects that the fundraising has um, has served to, to benefit. So let's keep it up. Um, please get involved, contact us. Um, as little or as much help as people have got um, will all be welcome. Even if you just want to come along with ideas and get to know people, it will all be welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you, Victoria. And uh, well done. And because the PTA is an amazing group of people and we have such fun. They are as well. wonderful. They, they are really wonderful. are. And the amount of money is, is incredible. Um, you know, and our children benefit from it as well. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you. I'll see you soon. Will do. Thanks. Thanks for having so, me. So we're just coming to the end of the, the session now. And all I want to say is, you know, we are a wonderful community. It makes us so proud to be here. LVS has always been a bit of a head of the curve. So, for example, we raised the compulsory leaving age at school nearly 50 years before the government actually did it back in 1944 in the Education Act. We've always been ahead. We've we've survived 230 years. And I can tell you, we can survive any storm. We are an amazing school, a strong school, a strong community. You've seen that today with the people that we've had speaking here on LVS Perspectives. So with that in mind, I wish you a very lovely weekend. It's going to be beautiful weather, apparently better than Ibiza. OK, so enjoy the sunshine while it lasts. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Bye bye. <laughs>